The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments today on the constitutionality of an Arizona state law that requires its police to detain and arrest suspected illegal immigrants based on reasonable suspicion. A lower court ruled that Arizona had preempted the federal government's authority to set immigration law and blocked enforcement of that part of the state law. This is a little more than an hour. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to take up the first case that's on the calendar, and that, that is uh, the United States of America versus the State of Arizona. Uh, we've allotted 30 minutes per side. The appellant, um, if the appellant wishes to save some time for rebuttal, that's perfectly fine. Just keep an eye on the clock. It's counting down. So with that, just a reminder. Uh, we're ready to begin. So, for the state of Arizona. Good morning. My name is John Bauma. I represent the state of Arizona and Governor Jan Brewer, who's with us in court today. I'd like to try to reserve five minutes for a rebuttal, if That's I may. That's fine. Your Honor, Honor, Arizona is trying to deal with the problems that arise from a federal immigration system that even President Obama acknowledges is broken. Arizona is a border state, and it's on the very front lines. There's serious crimes that are involved in the drug trafficking, the human trafficking, human smuggling, and the other activities, the coyotes who thrive because once an immigrant, an alien, an illegal alien is in the United States, the chances of removal are so low that basically crossing the border is the same as crossing the finish line. With a federal government that's been unable or unwilling to solve the problem, Arizona passed a public policy whereby they wish their Arizona law enforcement officers to assist in the implementation and enforcement of federal immigration law to the maximum extent permitted by federal law. The district judge apparently deciding that Arizona law enforcement officers would uh, forget their training or experience or the Constitution and act in an unconstitutional manner, has entered an injunction that basically preserves the status quo. And that status quo is simply unacceptable well, well, to those the, of didn't us. The district court just focused on four provisions, correct? Yes, sir. That's all that's at issue here. I'm sorry? We're only dealing with four of the provisions in the law. Yes, sir. Mr. Bama, let's forget about what arguments you might address to a jury or to a legislature. Tell us how Judge Bolton was wrong on each of those four, if you would, please. Okay. With respect to, uh, I think we would first start with the proposition that says that this is a facial challenge. and. Uh, she mentioned the facial challenge, the standard for a facial challenge, principally that uh, there's no set of circumstances exists under which the statute would be valid. Or put another way, with respect to each of these sections challenged, that it's unconstitutional in every conceivable application. That's ask, simply not you, true. Let me ask you this. You mentioned Salerno. 
Is that principle somewhat in tension with the government's argument here that these provisions are preempted completely? The, it, these provisions are not preempted completely. They, in every instance, comply with the congressional objectives. There's not a one of them that does not comply with conge congressional objectives. They do not conflict in any way. You can comply with both state and federal law in each particular instance, and none of them stand as an obstacle to the full uh, purposes and objectives of Congress. There is no express preemption. The only preemption would be field preemption, and that would be the regulation of immigration, which basically is just to decide who should sh and should not be admitted to the country, and the circumstances under which a legal entrant should remain. And Decanus tells us that the rest of this is under the police power and that every regulation of aliens is not a regulation of immigration. And so we're back to the proposition there's no express preemption, there's no implied preemption, and there's no well, conflict preemption. Would you tailor that argument to Section 3? With respect to Section 3? The registration. Yes, sir. They have, uh, Arizona passed a, uh, a set of standards that are, are laws essentially the same as the federal law, 1304 and 1306, and said if you're in violation of that, essentially, you're in violation of state law. Now, that is consistent with congressional uh, objectives. Certainly, the fact that the administration doesn't choose to enforce them shouldn't mean that Congress doesn't want them enforced, particularly when you look at what Congress has done all along the way in encouraging state and local officials to assist Congress. So if you look at uh, Section 13, well, 1644, 1357, and such. Mr. Bauma, but on that point, in Hines, the Supreme Court said that Pennsylvania adding as a misdemeanor the failure to register under Pennsylvania's act was uh, treading in federal ground. We have, under Section 1304 and 1306, a well-detailed and regulated policy of what documents uh, immigrants or aliens must carry in this country under the federal statute. What Arizona is doing is saying, that's fine, but if you don't carry those, we're going to put you in jail for up to a year or fire or fine you. Isn't that so? No, uh, Your Honor. I, I think the uh, Arizona statute has lesser penalties than the federal, and I think it goes 30 to 60 days. Nobody's talking about well, putting All right. Even 30 or 60 days. It's well, a that's misdemeanor. What, but that's what the federal government, that's what Congress, and Congress is the people that count. Congress uh, has those penalties. They have stiffer penalties than uh, Arizona does. And so all Arizona's is doing is saying comply with the rules. Is it your argument that a state can take a look at whether the federal government is enforcing its laws, and if the federal government is not enforcing its laws, it can uh, enforce the laws for the federal government? For instance, if I don't pay my income tax to the federal government, can California come along and sue me for not paying my income tax? Well, I don't think California would be particularly interested in enforcing the federal income tax, but Arizona is certainly particularly interested in seeing that the people within its border comply with the rules because Arizona is bearing the brunt of the federal government's failure to enforce it. You know, you mentioned Hines. Hines is a conflict case. Hines did not say that there was no room for the states to work in this particular area. As a matter of fact, there's a particular paragraph in Hines that says the concept of whether this is within the realm of both is specifically reserved. So it's a, Hines is a conflict case, and the statute in Hines, the Pennsylvania scheme, was totally at odds with the uh, government scheme. This is not totally at odds with the government scheme. This is doing what Congress says. The fact that the administration won't enforce what Congress says doesn't mean Arizona should have to bear the brunt of it. They, how do they come in and claim preemption by saying, we're occupying the field, but we're not doing much about it? We choose not to enforce it. All right. How about section two? 
Section two is simply a codification of what people are already doing. In almost every jurisdiction, they're doing it on a discretionary basis. They're investigating suspected illegal aliens. All the uh, to be does is codify what both even the United States and the district court essentially said is constitutionally permissible. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, it seems to me reasonable for them to ascertain the status of the person arrested and ascertain it from a federal source. But there is also the provision that in the case of an arrest, the person will not be released until that status is determined. Now, I don't know any provision of federal law that goes that far. And isn't that getting into federal territory? The, the, the provision that we're, you're talking about, which is the second sentence, we think has to be construed to be inconsist consistent with the first, third, and fourth sentences of that paragraph, at which point the only people who are investigated are those who there's a reasonable suspicion are an alien. Oh, that's fine. Uh, but no, my I think you want, I want to focus on shall not be released until it's determined. Yes, and that, it, uh, that it, can it, only be determined with uh, in the context of the Fourth Amendment. Yes, I understand all that. But how can we construe it so the detention does not uh, exceed what would be uh, possible under federal law. The, the statute 2B specifically contains the provision, uh, and basically I can tell you, it, it, it says that it will be uh, construed in accordance with federal immigration law to, and to preserve the constitutional rights of all persons and the privileges and immunities of a United States citizen. That's part of 2B, well, which means it incorporates the Fourth Amendment standards. All right, well, let's, let's suppose a, a person is arrested uh, uh, with reasonable belief that uh, they've uh, uh, committed uh, a felony, and then they post bail and are able to get out. But then the statute says, no, you don't get out until your immigration status is determined. How, how do you reconcile that? Well, if they, ordinarily, if they go to jail, somebody's going to determine the uh, immigration status anyway because well, of the I requirements know, no, of the no, no, international I, standards. I, I can see that, that, they, that often that would be done. But uh, this is an absolute statement. It shall not be released until it is determined. And they're, they're let out on bail, but then the statute kicks in, doesn't it? And say they shan't be released. Well, I don't think you can, if you take the other provision, you got to go as far as the Fourth Amendment allows you, then you have to turn them loose. If you can't determine within a reasonable time what their immigration status is, that statute specifically provides uh, that you have to turn them loose. I mean, that's Obama. the provision of con being consistent with the constitutional rights of of all persons. Mr. Obama, isn't it also true that if the Immigration Service were to pick up an illegal alien and were in the process of determining whether he was legal or not, the statute requires him to be presented to an officer within the shortest time possible to be admitted in a bail? Yes. Isn't that what would happen here? I think the idea is to follow the right. usual procedures we have reasonable suspicion we have you need the next thing you need is probable cause and then the next thing you have to do is let them go if you can't identify them and perhaps on bail and, and have on bail or otherwise if you're out on the highway and you can't identify them uh, would, would you clarify for me there's some debate between the parties about just how uh, sentence one and sentence two are to be interpreted um, I'm just curious about how you envision this statute working for the officer in the field. Well, in the first place, officers, I'll just start with the proposition that officers certainly understand the concepts of reasonable suspicion. 
and probable cause and the Terry stop and how long you can keep somebody. So then the statute, sec the second sentence has to be construed to deal only with respect to those about whom there's a reasonable suspicion. And that's consistent with the first sentence and the third and fourth sentences. Secondly, you know, I think the court failed to apply three, two, three principles here with respect to the interpretation. One is to interpret a statute in a constitutional manner. Two is interpret it so it's sensible and doesn't end up with an absurd result. And three, to interpret it in accordance with the legislative intent. And when you look at this statute, the legislative intent is to deal with illegal aliens. You know, Arizona has a long and proud tradition of Hispanic uh, me, population. Just, Nobody's let me trying just to follow up on, on your on your response. So the, the statute goes on to provide uh, uh, that if the person stopped or arrested or detained produces a document like a valid dri Arizona's driver's license, that's a presumption that they're here legally. But in the case of an arrest, as Judge Noonan was pointing out, what, what happens if they produce a valid driver's license? Under the statute, they're still to verify whether the person's here illegally? No, that's the no. point. That's it? So, if, you, so the, when, if they have a driver's license, that's it. They don't have to, right. do, they don't have to comply with the other parts of the statute. It's all over. It's all over. It's all over, and which is a lot better than the current status because the current status doesn't give you that That doesn't seem to be what the statute says, though. Sir? It doesn't seem to be what the statute says. Well, it does. I, I think the statute is pretty clear on that, that if they have a driver's license, it's presumptive that it's taken care of and they're gone. No, it I says mean, a person Again, is if you're going back to the concept that we're, the statute is intending to deal with illegal aliens, that it is illegal aliens that we're talking about. If you try to interpret it the way the, Bowen, either the government or the, the district court did. Answer Judge question. I'm sorry? In answer to Judge Pius's question. Okay. It doesn't say a person is conclusively presumed to not be an alien by the presentation of an Arizona driver's license. It says a person is presumed not to be an alien. That's a presumption which can be rebutted by a conversation between the officer and the alien which indicates reasonable suspicion that he is not a admitted alien or an American citizen. You will concede that. You're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, very often in practice, the first thing the alien tells them is that he's not a citizen. <laughs> I mean, that takes care of the reasonable suspicion, usually. If we were to interpret the statute in a way that is constitutional, yes, they certainly would. Let's, let's, why don't we, why don't you address, there are two other provisions that the district court enjoined. Yes, sir. Uh, would you like to talk about five? Whichever one, whichever one uh, you're, you're, you want okay, to Okay, well, next. five is the uh, issue of whether you can, uh, whether uh, you can make a, a criminal penalty for um, uh, being employed. For, uh, to, it's a, a to attach a penalty to uh, for on people who are unauthorized to work, to penalize them as a way of discouraging them from working, the that is clearly consistent with congressional intent. The reason they are unauthorized workers is Congress has made it clear that they're not supposed to be working. Congress has chosen to first try to deal with it from the employer standpoint, and they, in that particular instance, did uh, put in an express preemption <coughs> provision, but it was a partial express preemption provision, even with respect to employers. And they certainly didn't put any express preemption provision in with respect to employees, nor is it clear if you look at the statute or anything Congress has done, is there any clear and manifest intent to preempt the area of employees. Congress has even 
put some penalties on employees for using false statements and things. This is a problem because, you know... I'll tell you what the problem is, Mr. Bowman, is that you're arguing something which is foreclosed to us. In the case of National Center in 1990, Judge Ferguson found and wrote that the congressional intention was not to punish employees. Now, right or wrong, this three-judge panel must follow that rule. We are not an end bank panel. So now tell me why Judge Ferguson's opinion in National Center does not bind this court. Well, Judge Ferguson's opinion in that instance went to uh, the legislative intent. And to determine the legislative intent, he looked at the hearing that consisted of a five-person committee, three of whom were present. And from that, he divined the legislative intent. And that seems a long way from being clear and manifest let that us they suppose, to preempt it. Let us suppose I stipulate to the fact that, Mr. F that Judge Ferguson was absolutely wrong. Hmm? You got that in mind? I agree with you, let's say. I don't, but I, but I, I, <laughs> but I say I agree with you, right? How does a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit overrule another three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit on what the legislative intent was? Judge Ferguson found the legislative intent on a bail order of an immigrant, of an alien, which said that he couldn't work during the period of time of bail to be inconsistent with the legislative intent, which was not to punish workers while they were awaiting their asylum hearings or other uh, proceedings under immigration, but to let them work and earn enough money to feed themselves and not be public charges. Right? That was his idea. Now, Judge Ferguson, rest in peace, may have been wrong, but how can we turn that around and agree with you? I think you are in a position, should you decide, to decide that that was simply wrong. Well, if wrong. Our, 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 <laughs> our case law doesn't allow us to do that. Yeah. We're bound by what a prior three-judge panel says. No, if, if or you're unless a, there's a change in the law, either by the Supreme Court or by an en banc panel, or by a statute. <laughs> anyway, that, that, Nash, uh, Immigrant Rights Center is a case that poses some problems for you with respect okay. to Section uh, 5. How about the final section before your time runs out? You might want to address okay. Section the, 6. With respect to uh, Section 6, that is a provision that is really consistent with a federal statute, 1252C. Uh, it permits uh, a Arizona law enforcement officer to make a warrant arrest of somebody who is removable from the country. And the idea of that is to permit uh, Arizona law enforcement officers to work with ICE and to hold suspects when ICE tells them they want them held. For instance, people who have been removed, who've been convicted of a, a violent client crime, or a public offense, and who have been removed and returned, or doesn't, who doesn't have agreed to. Doesn't this statute pose leave. the same problems that that Judge Noonan was talking about with respect to arrest and detention? I don't believe it does, sir. Uh, Why not? Well, this is somebody that ICE wants held. This is somebody who has committed a well, public offense and has either been removed or returned to the country, uh, it's, it's and not therefore it, to illegally, and is subject to arrest and detention. And, Excuse me, it's, it's not restricted to returnees, is it? No. It could, could be somebody who... But that is an example, somebody who's absconded and not gone, or somebody who has gone and returned. Either one would apply. They're both clearly removal. Well, it also goes to somebody who is uh, arrested. They run a National uh, Crime Inf Information Center check, and they find that he was convicted, sentenced, served his term for second-degree murder, and is free, 
your Arizona policeman can arrest him because he's removable. That's right. For an aggravated felony under 1227 of the INA. That's right. right. And the judge made it appear, the district judge made it appear very complicated about who was removable well, and it who it may not. Be but clear, the law tells us it isn't. It may be clear in some cases, like murder or bank robbery or sexual abuse of a minor, right, which are all causes for removal, even though the sentence has been served. Right? And it may be unclear in other cases. But this is a facial challenge, isn't it? And that's my point. That was about the point I was to make. Is you consider that there a right are line? constitutional applications clearly? The uh, uh, ICE maintains a database of people who have been removed and a database of those who've been convicted of those kinds but of things. Hasn't the, the, the federal government, through a very elaborate scheme, established a, whole, a, a, a lengthy process for determining whether somebody's removable or not? There's, well, a, there's a lengthy uh, process. It's not an easy call whether somebody, just because somebody has committed a crime, I mean, there's some of the obvious ones that Judge, that Judge uh, Bea alluded to, but there's some, there are many that are, aren't. But that's what we're we debate among ourselves whether or not a, a particular offense is a crime of moral turpitude or, a, or, or is a, a serious felony. Well, the Petillo Court, Justice Stevens made it clear that there's a whole lot of areas that it's pretty clear. But I guess the main point is this is a facial challenge. And that's the main point with respect to each of these. It's a, it's a facial challenge, and there are certainly circumstances in which it can be applied in a constitutional manner. It is not, all, it is not unconstitutional in every conceivable aspect. Well, look, I'm still trying to understand how this statute works. That is, so an officer determines, by running a data check, that somebody has been convicted of, I don't second-degree murder or whatever you want to, whatever crime you might want to pinpoint. Um, they take him into they arrest him without a warrant. Oh, well, they made, made right. They take him into custody, and what what do they hold him for? Well, let's suggest that. What do they, they hold him for? Well, let's suggest that before they arrest him, they ID him. They 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 have a reasonable suspicion. They've got to have right. arrest picked him up for a lawful stop, uh, or detention, or arrest, and then they have to have a reasonable suspicion. Now they've checked with ICE. They found out who the individual is. And that's important because until they do that, neither ICE nor they know who they have. It's a theory of Congress in encouraging the communications with ICE because you don't know who you've got. You can't catch them unless you know about them. And so they've reported that to ICE. Now they both know who they have. Now ICE says, we want to hold him. He was supposed to be I'm sorry. Suppose I says we, we need you to couldn't, check. Then you couldn't. Uh, then if you're going to talk about people acting in a constitutional manner, and get back to the fact that you assume they will, uh, and secondly that this is only a facial challenge and there are constitutional applications, this law can be applied in a constitutional manner, and you'd assume that the police officer would let that in. So how long does ICE, how, So how long does ICE have to get back? Well, uh, that depends upon the 24 circumstances. 24 hours, certainly. 48 hours, a week? No, I think that if you're talking about uh, reasonable suspicion, probable cause, it's less than 24 hours in both. The truth of it is the experience, you can look at all the statements that have been submitted. They usually get an answer back from ICE in something less than 11 minutes. Okay. All right. Well, do you want us I'm, to... Uh, I'm past my... Yeah, do you want us to construe the statute so it can only operate after... The Arizona officer uh, uh, asks ICE for a ruling. I don't think it's the only time it might happen because, as I say, Padilla says there are some relatively clear things. They could uh, perhaps arrest him, but the concept would basically to provide the authority that is required uh, if you're going to implement the federal statute, 1256C, uh, uh, that and that that needs to have state authority. There may be state authority. We just don't know. But this is to clarify that. And I'm way yes. into my. Re okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Good morning, and may it please the court. Edwin Needler for Appley uh, United States. 
Uh, before discussing the particular four provisions at issue here, I would like to first um, lay out the constitutional structure and preemption provisions that we think govern uh, the val validity of those provisions. The Constitution of the United States vests the subject matter of immigration in the national government. That no. is because national government, no, in Congress. In Congress. There's a big uh, yes. difference between the national well, government and Congress, is there not so? Con Congress in the enactment and the executive branch in the execution of the law under, right. under Article II. Uh, and, and the interference with the execution of the law is part of our submission. So long here. as the execution of the law is done fairly and well. Yes. Uh, and, and this is because the subject matter of immigration, which after all is the treatment of foreign nationals and nationals within our own borders, is a core aspect of foreign relations. And indeed, one of the purposes for adoption of the Constitution was a concern that individual states might embroil the entire nation in disputes with other countries. Uh, and it's therefore important not to allow for a patchwork of state laws, but rather for the nation to speak with one voice. And in this context, it's particularly important to protect the rights of U.S. citizens abroad in their reciprocal treatment. Mr. Mayor, has there been any um, <clears throat> adverse foreign relations since the year 2007 when the state of New Jersey adopted by order, but not by statute, a similar requirement to its police force that anyone who was stopped for an indictable crime or drunk driving should have his immigration provision, uh, uh, status checked? Well, uh, I'm not aware of uh, a level of uh, dissatisfaction or, or concerns that has arisen right. now, but, now, but... Secondly, how about the same rule in Rhode Island? Has that led to our foreign relations being deteriorated as a result of checking immigration status? There have been, there have been concerns expressed uh, in, in recent years. But as to Rhode Island? Well, I'm, I'm not sure specifically. As to New Jersey? I'm, I'm not sure. Or only as to Arizona? No, the, 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 the uh, declaration submitted by Deputy Secretary Steinberg explains that this particular law has brought to the fore a broader concern. Those concerns would be applicable to any such well, law. Mr. Neer, let me ask you, has any other state, New Jersey or Pennsylvania or uh, Nevada or any other state ever, ever issued a declaration that um, the legislature declares that the intent of this act is to make attrition through enforcement the public policy of all state and local government agencies in Arizona. No, and, and I think that's an important point. This is an extraordinary state statute that enacts a combination of, of additional criminal penalties added on top of those adopted by Congress and a mandatory enforcement scheme for mandatory checks with, uh, with DHS uh, any time uh, there is a stop and, and reasonable suspicion. Section 1 of the Act describes that these provisions are designed to work together to adopt attrition by enforcement and to adopt a public policy of the state of Arizona that is independent and outside the control of Congress and the ex or outside the control of the no, national no, government. Is that part of the statute? Pardon me? Did they say we're going to operate outside of the control? Well, it... it I it, mean, it, don't put words into the statute. I, I'm, I'm, I, but I mean, that, that's rhetoric, not, not statutory rhetoric. Well, uh, it's, it's a description of the consequences of what well, happens, because it, if, I, if I could explain... No, for, we're well aware of this. Why don't you concentrate on the provisions that you... And I, I would like to switch to Section 3 in particular, uh, which establishes a state crime for uh, failure to register or carry a registration card as, as required by the federal criminal statutes. But it only applies to people who are unlawfully present in the United States. So in effect, it criminalizes unlawful presence. Those prosecutions are brought by the state. They are not subject to the control of the United States uh, government. We think that's preempted clearly for three reasons. First of all, it is a direct regulation of immigration. The, the federal provisions, 1304 and 1306, that are cross-referenced there are part of Congress's comprehensive and direct regulation of immigration. It follows that the state's imposition of, of criminal sanctions over and above and on top of those same state prohibitions are themselves regulations of immigration and preempted. Mr. Needler, I, I don't want to speak to for my colleagues, but I don't think you have to spend a great deal of time on Section 3. Okay. Um, I, I, 
I, I do want to make the point, though, that the other provisions of the Act, particularly Section 2, was designed to work in tandem with Section 3, so that if there was a stop and somebody well, one point that, that Arizona makes with respect to Section 3 is it does nothing more than to complement what the, what the federal scheme. Well, in, in Hines versus Davidowitz, the, the Supreme Court said that the, uh, the registration scheme at issue there, and this was built on top of that, does occupy uh, the field. And the court specifically said that, is, that a state may not complement or add auxiliary regulations and additional criminal penalties on top of that, we think are exactly that. But in addition, there's conflict preemption here because the effect of the provision is to criminalize illegal presence in the, in the United States because it only applies to people, the state statute does, only applies to people who are unlawfully present. As we explain in our brief, it is contrary to the policy of the United States in statutes and consistent with international practice not to criminalize mere presence uh, in the United States. And so for all of those reasons, we think that, that Section 3 is, is preempted because it is direct regulation uh, of immigration. If, if I if I might, unless the court has further questions on, on uh, Section 3, I, I could uh, switch to Section 5 um, of the statute. The That's fine. The employment, uh, the em employment uh, uh, provision. Um, uh, with respect to, to Section 5, as the court pointed out, uh, this court's decision in the National Immigrant Rights uh, case did analyze the uh, backdrop and the enactment of the federal prohibition, uh, the employer sanction provision, and, con and recognized that Congress had considered but, uh, but deliberately rejected the uh, possibility of imposing sanctions well, on Well, I, I think you, you heard uh, Judge Bayer. It, it's common ground. We are bound by that decision, that end of, end of argument. Yes. You I, don't need to say a word more. <laughs> Why don't you go on to two? Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> if, if, if I could just add one point on that, uh, on, on section five, I, you, I, you have to do it. No, but <laughs> I, 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 I'd, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to underscore uh, uh, one point that I, I think reinforces why the court was correct in its evaluation. And it's not just a legislative history point, which, which the court addressed in, uh, in the uh, NCIR case. And, and that point is that uh, the 1324A of the Federal Act has a specific prohibition requiring an individual employee to attest uh, that he is lawfully present and authorized to work. And there are criminal sanctions under the Federal Act for, uh, for violating that provision. Significantly, there is another provision uh, in 1324A that says the attestation that the individual employee makes may not be used for any purpose except to enforce the federal statute. Right. Um, and to us, that, that clearly uh, shows that Congress contemplated that the employee's involvement and the attestation that he has to make in connection uh, with, uh, with applying for employment could only lead to federal consequences and that there would be no uh, uh, state consequences. That's a point that was not made in the NCIR uh, point, and it is a textual point right in the face of the statute. You mean to think. say that if there's a perjurious declaration, the state in which that perjury is committed cannot prosecute him? I, uh, it, it, I believe that is probably correct, but putting that to one side, it cannot make the employment itself unlawful. Uh, whether or not it could it could punish the why do you believe of a false why do you believe the a state could not prosecute a perjury committed on a federal document well uh, well if, if, if it's if it's um, regulating perjury against the United States in the same way that section three is preempted so would that be it's not up to a state to prosecute false statements made to the federal government. Do you have any authority for that? The, the Supreme Court's decision in the Buckman case, it dealt in the civil context, but it was, but it was a case involving Buckman. fraud on the FDA, and the Supreme Court said that the relationship, in, in, specifically in the context of fraud, between a federal agency and those whom it regulates is a matter to be addressed by the federal government, and the state could not create a civil uh, cause of action for fraud, and, and uh, again, there's no need for the court to decide that here, but I think... I'm not talking will... about a civil cause of action for fraud. I'm talking about a criminal penalty for per perjury. Well, uh, but, but again, 
if the, the question is whether the state would have the sub, would, would have authority over the subject matter, whether it does that by criminal or, or civil uh, means, we, we don't think would uh, w would. Is would there a case matter. that you have in mind where the state is found not to have ability to prosecute somebody who perjured himself to the federal government? Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of a, a, a specific case, but it, but but again, that relationship we think would ordinarily be uh, governed by by federal law. Um, so it, I've addressed the two substantive criminal provisions that the state has engrafted on top of the comprehensive uh, federal scheme. Now, if I may, I'd like to turn to section uh, 2B um, uh, of the Act, and that is the. As you do, as you talk about section 2B, I'm interested in in how Salerno fits into this scheme. Well, we, we believe that this statute uh, is preempted on its face, and, 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 uh, and we believe, and let, let me explain why, and I think it's consistent with the Salerno formulation. Do you, you stipulate that this is a facial challenge? Yes, it is a, it is a facial challenge. Uh, but we believe this provision is unconstitutional in, in every application, and here's why. What we object to and what is preempted in this context is the mandatory nature of, of the requirement. We do not question the authority of the state to, uh, in a state law enforcement officer, for example, in the course of an ordinary stop uh, or, or either traffic stop or stopping someone uh, on the sidewalk in a Terry stop uh, to um, question someone about uh, his identity, about his status, and to check with INS, indeed, excuse me, DHS, because indeed federal officials uh, rely often upon information gleaned from state and local law enforcement. What, what, what is problematic about this is the mandatory nature of it, because what the state has done is to harness the federal enforcement apparatus in aid of this separately uh, constituted state mandatory criminal um, en enforcement approach to the immigration laws. Let me ask you, I know that's the theme of your brief, but why does it harness it? Isn't Congress capable of saying no? Well, if, if, if this is a burden? Congress, uh, Congress, Congress could, but we think Congress already has said no. And, and let me. Well, let, is let there me, anything in this uh, statute indicating yes. that you won't well, tell us? That's interesting. Uh, yes, there is. And, and we, 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 think, we think where it is manifested most clearly is in the provision of the act, uh, section 287G it's called, or, or 1357G of, of uh, Title VIII. And the, the first nine sections of that provision, uh, established, and this was enacted in IRERA in, in 1996, establish a mechanism under which DHS through ICE can enter into a cooperative law enforcement agreement with a state and local either law enforcement agency or correctional agency uh, and under that provision, the state officers may uh, exercise authorities of ICE um, officers, uh, in, including, including, in fact, doing checks in, a, in appropriate uh, circumstances. But the Act makes clear that where there's an agreement like that, the state and local officers are, have to act under the supervision of uh, ICE officers and have to fo follow ICE priorities in terms of law enforcement. But not under G-10. Well, under, under, under G-10, it says notwithstanding, no provision of this act, I think it says, will stop the, uh, nothing in the subsection shall be construed to require an agreement under this subsection in order for any officer or employee of a state or political subdivision of a state to communicate with the attorney general regarding the immigration status of any individual, including reporting knowledge that a particular alien is not lawfully present in the United States, or otherwise to cooperate with the Attorney General in the identification, apprehension, detention, or removal of aliens not lawfully present in the United States. So 287G officers are under the AG, but under G-10, this doesn't stop regular officers from doing exactly what I've read. And, and our position is not that they're not authorized to. Our objection is that, that the state statute mandates it. Well, it's and, up to and, the and, state how they want to use their people, well, right? Well, I, 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 I don't think so, with all respect, because uh, 
if one looks at 10B, it's true, an agreement is not required for state officers to cooperate, but the pertinent language, the important language, is cooperate with the Attorney General. When one sovereign utilizes its law enforcement officers to assist a second sovereign, I think the background understanding would be that it's the second sovereign whose laws are being enforced who would take the lead, and the other officer here, the officers of Arizona, are assisting the second sovereign, the United States. That's all very nice and well as to subsection B, but listen again. To communicate with the Attorney General regarding the immigration status of any individual. That doesn't say to communicate when the Attorney General wants you to communicate or wants you to cooperate to communicate. This is a right under the federal statute for the local people to communicate with the Attorney General. Section 10 contemplates that that will be part of a broader cooperative relationship, and I think, again, this is demonstrated, I think, by the text. Paragraph A says to communicate with the Attorney General, and then B says otherwise cooperate, otherwise to cooperate. Besides communicating. Well, but the otherwise to cooperate, the otherwise refers back to A. The communication is part of the cooperative relationship between the state and the federal government. Isn't the obligation of the federal government made very clear by sections 1373C, 8 U.S.C. 1373C, which is entitled obligation to respond to inquiries? The Immigration and Naturalization Service shall, mandatory word, respond to an inquiry by a federal, state, or local government agency seeking to verify or ascertain the citizenship or immigration status of any individual, etc., etc., etc. It doesn't say when we want to. It doesn't say in our discretion. It doesn't say when we have funds available. It says shall. Our point doesn't turn on the response that DHS makes. It turns on the antecedent conduct of the state and local police officers who would be, by hypothesis, are making inquiries of the alien before we even get to what would be submitted to ICE. They would be stopping someone and prolonging that stop by hypothesis and circumstances that they might not otherwise do it in the absence of 1070. They might not do it, or they might do it, and this is a facial challenge. So you've got to prove that every time they would stop someone, that would be an unconstitutional stop. No. No, our burden is to show that every time the mandatory application is impermissible because it takes away the discretion of the local law enforcement officer to decide whether to pursue a particular line of inquiry rather than mandate. What about the first sentence of Section 2? It says if you have reasonable suspicion, if it's practicable, if it won't interfere with the investigation, then you can request his immigration status. But in those circumstances, it is mandatory, and those parts of the first sentence do not provide for the state or local officer to take into account federal priorities. The only thing that can be taken into account are the state or local law enforcement officer's own set of priorities. What federal priorities? Well, as we explained in our brief, the Secretary of Homeland Security through ICE has established priorities, for example, in the enforcement of the Immigration Act. But there can be no priority established under ICE or by ICE as to responding to the obligation to respond to inquiries. What I'm describing here doesn't go to ICE's response to the inquiry. It goes to the antecedent conduct by the police officer when he encounters someone on the beat in the neighborhood or stopping a car. What does that officer do? You want him to say, what would the feds do in this case? No, I think what we would want him to say is, what would I do if left to my own law enforcement judgment, knowing what the feds' approach is with respect to particular problems? He's been told what to do. He's been told by the Arizona legislature and by the governor what to do, which is, if you have reasonable suspicion, if it's practical to do so, if it won't interfere with the investigation, run an immigration check. It takes 11 minutes, according to the last speaker. 
And, and our, again, our problem is that the state has mandated it. And what it has let done then is... Let me you keep saying mandate. Let me ask you. Suppose before Arizona passed this statute, this provision, um, and let's assume no agreement, no cooperative agreement, could the sheriff of some local county say to his officers, whenever you make a stop and you think there's reasonable suspicion that, this per that the person you stopped is here illegally, you run a check with INS. I think that would present the same problem. Why? Be because it's the, not mandatory. The state hasn't said it's mandatory. Well, the, but the sheriff has, and, the, and the, if, the, if the sheriff adopts a policy, and, and for these purposes and, and in others, I think a, a, a policy by the by the sheriff or the department and how matters are to be conducted should be regarded as as having the force of law if it's intended to bind the officers uh, who work well, for him. It's just a prior, it's just, you know, it's, the, uh, the sheriff has decided in his discretion as he's running his department and directing his officers. Well, but, but, the, but the, in that situation where, the, where the, the, uh, the sh it's, it's not solely the sheriff's concern when it comes to the enforcement of federal immigration law. Well, suppose, oh, suppose the sheriff hasn't issued such a policy statement and the officers just say, well, on our own, you know, I made a stop here and it looks like this guy's illegal. Uh, he said he's illegal. He's not here. Doesn't well, at, at, I'm going to call. I, I'm going to call. I'm going to check. What's wrong with that? Well, that, that, you know, at, at, at some point, the, you know, at some point what an individual officer does, uh, you know, May, may not may not rise to the level of a legal problem, but even in the case of, a, of an individual officer, if, if there was an issue, that would be worked out in the cooperative relationship between the federal government and the state. Well, there's, so another, but, there's another. There's another. I don't understand why why an officer couldn't, independent of this law, uh, and in, even in light of the existing federal laws that we've been talking about, couldn't on his own decide to call ICE about a particular. Uh, person he's detained. Every time. He's, he certainly can. Let me, let me, let me just. It, would be, it seems to me to be perfectly permissible. It is permissible, but there, there's another aspect of the state statute here which, which we think is really important in underscoring what Arizona is trying to accomplish here, and that's the private right of action. Well, now, the, the, Mr. Needler, let's not get away from this point, because I've read your brief, I read the district court, I've heard your interchange with my two colleagues, and I don't understand your argument. And, you know, we are dependent as a court on counsel being responsive, focusing, trying to help us not go down, just fall like soldiers in defense of some position that has been told, that has been told that you keep saying there's a problem that a state officer is told to do something. That's not a matter of, of preemption. If the federal government, Wants to preempt this field, Congress can say so. We cut off communications. We don't want to have this information sought. But it hasn't done so. Judge Bayer made very clear to you, it has not done so. And the, uh, the, I would think the proper position would be to concede that this is a point well, you don't have an argument. No, with, with respect, we do, we do believe we have an argument. And if I, if I could uh, make two other points we, that we think critically underscore that. First of all, the, the, the mandatory nature of Section 2B is coupled with the private right of action later in Section 2, which provides that any citizen of the state, not just the, the sheriff running the, the department, but any citizen of the state can bring a private right of action uh, if the, if uh, there is a policy of not enforcing the state, uh, excuse me, the immigration laws to the maximum extent possible. So this builds in a powerful incentive for a state or local officer to pursue questioning in circumstances which ordinary law enforcement would not call for. The state has singled out this one subject matter of immigration for this extraordinary mandatory requirement in a subject matter that is a f exclusively federal subject matter in its, in its prosecution and enforcement. The other thing that is extraordinary about this is it is it is geared to the reasonable suspicion standard. That is a familiar standard, but it is a familiar standard in terms of authorizing or permitting law enforcement. It is, it is a purposely low standard, far lower than preponderance, f f uh, lower than probable cause. 
but it's a standard that whose application daily depends upon the individual judgment of law enforcement officers in the field, often, often not exercising that power to the, to the hilt because of, of a recognition that, that maybe they should be applying a standard somewhat above this. This standard is now being transposed from what was from a permissive authorization in its usual application to a mandate every time a state or local officer uh, encounters someone on a beat and, and the circumstances, all the circumstances might lead to a, circum, to, a, to a judgment that there's reasonable suspicion that that person is unlawfully here. That officer must pursue the matter and ask questions when the officer would not otherwise Would it be similarly impermissible if the state of Arizona were to say, every time you stop or detain or arrest a person, you have to check him with the National Crimes uh, Center? To see if there are any outstanding warrants. That, that is that is a regular part. Of, that is a regular part of pro, of police. Or practice. every time you stop a person, you've got to take his fingerprints. Anything wrong with that? No, but but in that, in that circumstance, in, in that circumstance, the state is regulating its own state law enforcement. If the state wants to say every time you stop, not necessarily. If 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 the national uh, center has outstanding warrants from the state of California, there. That, that's not an Arizona crime. No, no, that's that's what that's the information the officer might find from the NCIC. Mm -hmm. But in terms of pursuing the NCIC, what's different about this is the state has singled out immigration and said you will pursue immigration in a way that you won't pursue any other state or or if federal you don't think the responsibility. State has any interest in seeing that uh, illegal aliens are removed from the state of uh, Arizona, even though many of them are also criminals. The the, the state certainly has an interest in that, but, but it's important to uh, focus on the fact that the encounter between the local law enforcement officer, maybe on the street or in school with a student who's been in a fight, and, and, the, and the officer may have some suspicion that that student in school might, might, be, uh, might be unlawfully present. All of a sudden, this law requires that that, that, that incident be pursued uh, uh, by the officer, but all of that is is geared not towards something that the state can do. The state cannot remove the person. The state cannot prosecute the person. It is all an intake for ultimate federal enforcement of the law. But the state can deliver an illegal alien over to the federal uh, of officials, and that may result in that person being removed it, it, it from it the does, state of but Arizona. It, but, but in the field, the cooperative relationship against which all federal state cooperation and law enforcement works is there's communication about that. Uh, be, before the person would be brought to ICE, the, there would be communication uh, uh, be, between the local law enforcement officer and ICE saying, what do you want me to do in this circumstance? What, what this provision does, to be does, in the words of Hines, is stand as an obstacle in every encounter to the cooperative relationship between the states and the federal government because it creates a state enforcement priority and a, a state mandatory enforcement approach backed by this private right of action and geared uh, in an in unprecedented way to the use of the reasonable suspicion standard, which, ha which as I said, has always been okay. one to authorize, but not used in this way to compel law enforcement officers. And the consequences Your of time is, uh, is rapidly decreasing there. And I'd like you to respond for a few moments to sections to the arguments advanced with respect to section six. Okay. With with respect to section six, uh, it, it presents uh, the problems that the district court identified uh, for starters. The party, as the district court pointed out, the um, uh, section six, the parties agreed in the lower court was geared to the situation where the crime might be. Uh, committed outside of Arizona because there was already authority within the state of Arizona to arrest uh, uh, someone, uh, to make a warrantless arrest of someone. Not, not if that person had already served a sentence. Arizona couldn't allow a warrantless arrest of someone. Right, no, no, that, no, that's in that. But this section does allow that. No, that... That's true, but that is not that is not a justification that was put forward in the uh, in it's the lower court. It's a justification that the district court talked about yeah. in its in its opinion. She noted that specifically. She noted her, it, but the, her the parties didn't address it. And right. and it's if if that's an additional justification, that's something that could be considered. Uh, this is just a preliminary injunction stage, so that's something that could be considered by the court. Well, but you have to show you're likely to win, and that would if that consideration were considered, you'd be likely to lose. 
No, I, I, I think it, it yeah, continues yeah. to present the problems that the, that the court identified because there's no requirement in Section 6 that the state or local officer contact ICE in order to find out whether an offense is removable. The individual would, the officer would have to make a judgment as to whether the public offense in the other state was also a public offense in Arizona and then determine whether it would in turn lead to a, uh, a removal. Suppose the response is like Judge Baez suggested earlier, second degree murder was the crime. Well, in, in, some, in, in, in that situation, it would probably, you know, it, it would probably be uh, possible to make that determination. So then why did, so then, so then doesn't, don't you have a Salerno problem with respect to Section 6? Well, I, 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 I don't think so because, they, because the, uh, there's no requirement to check with ICE, first of all, and, and, and the INA vests that responsibility uh, for making removability determinations in the, in the federal government. There may be s some situations in which something could be done otherwise. Wise. If I could just uh, make a final point about... Are you, are you pretty much conceding that then? No. That's applied in good work. The, we, 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 we believe there might be some circumstance in, 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 in which it could, but that that should be sorted out uh, on remand. If I could just again well, come back to well, section I two... Mean, is that a concession? Pardon me? Is that a concession that's not facially invalid? Well, it, it's not written in a way that takes account of those circumstances. That's the problem with saying it's not facially invalid. If it was written in a way that required that ICE be consulted before the conduct was taken, after all, it's a statute that focuses only on aliens. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the concern. So if it was written in a way that required that trigger, we think that it might be different, but it's not. Um, if I could just come could back be, to... Could it be construed that way? Pardon me? Could it be construed that way? I don't believe it could be. It, it's not a question of construing in words Arizona, in there. You, you heard the counsel of the state. Arizona seems quite willing to accept our, our construction of the statute. Well, I, I, I think that's on... They've discussed that in 2B. In, in, in 6, I think there's simply no language that could be read into the statute or construed to require a prior checking with, uh, with ICE. Uh, well, you look at the statute as a whole. The whole thrust is to communicate with the federal government. Uh, but there's no requirement that that be done before the local officer make a judgment on its own, and we think that's contrary to the general uh, cooperative uh, law enforcement. If I could just return to 2B for a moment, because that's, and I see my time is... Yes, is, you're uh, just, you're, you're, I've let you go one minute, but make your point and, and that's it. I, I just wanted to say that the, the, the Arizona statute here with its extraordinary mandatory uh, investigations has to be considered in light of what would happen if every state in the union did this. This is, and the, the United States nation as a whole is responsible to other nations for the ways in which their citizens are treated within the, within the United States. If every state did this, we would have a patchwork of laws as the Third Circuit's decision in Lozano, which struck down a similar law, uh, uh, concluded. And it's also important, as, this, as the Supreme Court recognized in Hines versus Davidowitz, to recognize how a statute like this can affect lawful permanent residents and citizens, because another important uh, factor underlying our immigration laws is to respect the civil liberties and not subject people to interrogations and to police surveillance. And this statute, because of its mandatory requirement based on minimal uh, reasonable suspicion, we think raises that concern very profoundly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few quick points. Sure. Uh, the business about reasonable, minimal, uh, the reasonable test of minimal reasonable suspicion. You know, INA, I mean INS, uh, Lopez uh, took care of that. The uh, INS Lopez Mendoza, where the, the courts, the Supreme Court specifically said that reasonable suspicion was a was a sufficient standard to protect those lawfully within the country. So it's been a time-honored standard. I don't know how suddenly it becomes so minimal. Secondly, it's pure speculation. And again, we're talking about a facial challenge here, but it's pure speculation that police officers are now going to check out people that they otherwise wouldn't have checked out in their discretion. The idea of this statute is to permit those people who have previously been subject to sanctuary city policies to, to make those checks. The third thing... Well, it, said, it does say a reasonable attempt shall be made in section yes. two. And if it does say shall. 
Yes, we, we encourage them to do it. You know, we gotta well, know who's there. That's a generous reading of shall. Uh, thirdly, uh, it is a. But I'll take it. I'm sorry. I'll take it. Uh, thirdly, you me you mentioned the National uh, Center case, and I had a chance to look at it during the argument a little bit. I guess the point I would emphasize is that the that particular case addressed whether DHS had the authority to enact those regulations. It did not uh, address the subject of whether the states in the exercise of their police power, uh, as indicated by Decanus and other cases, could uh, prohibit, uh, could address that particular subject. And the, and the National Center case also failed to uh, apply the presumption against preemption of state law because they weren't dealing with state law. They were de dealing with an administrative Mr. Boma, uh, application. If, if Judge Ferguson analyzed the congressional intent as to whether to punish employees as a condition of bonding them out, right? Yes, sir. Why isn't that general premise what the intent of Congress was applicable not only when DHS does it, but when the state does it? Well, DHS doesn't have any police powers to begin with. Secondly, but you we're, deal we're dealing now with the intent of Congress. You if the intent of Congress is found to be black by Judge Ferguson, just because it's in one room or another room, DHS or the state, doesn't stop it from being black. I was trying to address your question about, even if you agreed with me, which you weren't sure you did, about the legislative history, whether you were bound by that opinion. That's right. And my answer would be, I don't think you are, because he did not address the specific subject before you. He did not address the subject of the preemption, presumption against preemption, or the police powers of the state. And I think he was wrong, with all due respect, on legislative history. And when you take a five-person committee, three people present, and say that's the legislative history, that's a little bit of a stretch. We're your time, you're over your time, so I'll give you a minute to just sort of sum up your points. OK. Uh, your Honor, it's a facial challenge. We think that all these uh, four provisions are consistent with congressional objectives. It's congressional objectives that count rather than this administration's priorities. And you know, there are, there's no reason why Arizona should stand by and suffer the consequences of a broken system when Arizona has 15,000 well-trained and capable police officers, uh, law enforcement authorities on the ground who could help fix the system. And that's what Arizona wants to do. So we ask that you vacate this injunction and allow Arizona to get on with taking care of the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. And I appreciate your Thank time. you. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, we appreciate your arguments. Uh, the matter will be submitted at this time. And um, I, we court appreciates the vast interest in the case. Thank you. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes. In a few moments, former Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge on evolving terrorist threats. In about an hour and a half, a discussion of how telecommunications